We are so excited that you're here, Bonnie. <laughs> Not more excited than I am. <laughs> I think we should probably start by letting everybody know that we met you last October. It's actually been almost exactly a year. Mm -hmm. um, we got invited to go on a trip to Hawaii to help scout or to scout a potential retreat location. And we got brought together magically by all of these unbelievable people and have kept <laughs> a lot of connections and you are one of them. You're a gem. That was such a um, magical weekend. Can we yeah. say magical? I mean, it really was, right? Um, yeah. Just full of surprises and um, kismet connections. It was kismet. Yeah. I feel like the whole weekend we were like, you're the, you're the type of person we need to have on the podcast, Bonnie. So I'm, I'm really happy that we're And finally... I was glued to the two of you. <laughs> so many questions. So many and questions. We, we knew that your book was coming out. And so it was perfect timing because we mm -hmm. wanted to have you on to talk about your new book, The Life Brief. Um, we'll make sure that we link it out in the show notes, but for those watching on YouTube, you can see it right here. Um, and I'm so excited to dive into this with you. I think Selfishly, you know, I have obviously a 10 year background in marketing and advertising myself prior to making my career change. And so, as I was reading through it, and even when I was talking to you prior about what it was about when you were still in that process, I thought, well, doesn't it make sense to take a process that you use in advertising and marketing, right, in your strategic world? And I'm going to pause there in a second. I'm going to have you go back into like who you are and tell us. But mm -hmm. I was like, well, that makes sense. I use these philosophies every day in my life. And there's so much intertwine, uh, intertwining between psychology and marketing that it was like you finally were able to put it into a book for people to understand that mm. these two worlds are so connected. And why not use some of the tools here in your life here and some of the tools here in your life here? So first off, thank you for doing that. It's so helpful. Um, but can you take us, you know, one of the things we start with usually is like, who are you? How are you here? How did you get here? Like a little bit of background about how you came to be the magnificent human that you are. Oh, thank you for that question and <laughs> such a lovely intro. Um, well, I'm a career strategist. I, I know that that doesn't mean a whole lot to people outside of the marketing and advertising fields, but my job is to make meaning out of messiness. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in, in that world, it's for big companies, big brands. Well, they can be startups to legacy brands, you know, um, but it's really help to help people, companies cut through and distill their essence mm -hmm. in a really sharp and sticky way. Because when you have the clarity of your essence, who you are, what you stand for, what you believe in. And then also your ambition distilled in a way that sticks, meaning that you remember it, you can call it in and call it up whenever you need, then action decisions almost start to make themselves. It becomes really organic, automatic, easeful. Um, it's a power of clarity. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what strategists do for companies. We distill who they are down to their very essence. And that allows them to act in brave, innovative, creative ways because they know exactly why they exist in the world. Oof. So there was a moment in my own life, I'd been doing it for 25 years and um, I was hitting a huge road bump in my marriage. I had three kids under the age of five. I have four now, you know, but it was a moment of um, despair. I'll, I'll just admit it. It was a despairing moment where all I could think of was, uh, I think I'm in the wrong partnership. I, I think I'm with the wrong person. Um, and I didn't know what to do with that. And there were some natural questions that came out of my mouth one day while I was talking to one of my best friends. Um, while stuck, paralyzed in the parking lot of the grocery store. And once I mouthed those words, said it out loud, mm -hmm. um, those questions really tattooed themselves inside me. And they were, am I with the right person? Did I marry the right partner? Um, can I keep holding this big life we've created together? And what if my answer is no? Mm -hmm. What do I do then? And 
of course, no answers came in the parking lot. <laughs> But once voiced, those are the questions that stuck with me. And questions are a strategist's best friends. Because with questions, we unlock our um, curiosity and our, I mean, our determination to have good answers. Mm -hmm. So those questions kept coming up for me again and again. At that moment, they were unbearable questions. Mm -hmm. um, I, I couldn't face them because I was really scared about what the answers were on the other side. But then um, one day when I was alone on a business trip back in my childhood home, you know, at my parents' house, I came home late from work. The questions came up again. And for the first time, and I think this was rock bottom for me emotionally, I realized, wait a second. You know, I know despair from other people. I work a lot with people in despair. Maybe I need to try something different. And my reflex as a strategist kicked in mm -hmm. and I went to the central question, which is what do I want? Mm -hmm. Stop worrying about the outcomes, the what ifs, you know, um, what my parents will think what my husband's going to think, what my children will think, what they'll have to, you know, the consequences they'll have to suffer. But in my heart of hearts, what do I actually want? And that unlocked, that question unlocked everything. And I was able to vomit out <laughs> what I really wanted, you know, um, with the permission that it was only for me to answer for myself and not anyone else. And that gave me immense permission and space. And I, you know, I, that was when my first life brief came out and, and it had so much to do with time. And my first epiphany was that, oh, it's not my husband. That's the problem. <laughs> I've been carrying with me this weight that I was with the wrong person. What actually came out was my relationship with time and how I spend it is broken. Mm. And so that was the epiphany that gave me the first sliver and moment of hope. Oh, that maybe it wasn't as dire as mm. I thought it might have been. I want to ask, um, <laughs> because Danae and I actually talked about this for a moment before you hopped on earlier. Um, you know, you ask this question, what do you really want? Right. And that's kind of if I guess if I could say like the point of the life brief, right, is to be able to get to that, the clarity around that question, the answer to that question. And I will say that for me, when I, when I hear a question like that, and I know I'm not the only one because this is most of the clients I work with, that question brings up panic in me. Mm -hmm. um, it brings up a state of panic and a little bit of like wanting to freeze, Right. And I mean, I have a second go into the why psychologically, but I'm curious from your perspective, because I know that you've done the life brief, you know, within your company, within other organizations, Goop, all these different places. And I know I'm not the only one who's had that response to that question. So what do you do with people, right? With people like me <laughs> that have like a, oh shit around, hey, what do you really want? Hmm. Yeah. It, uh, what I've learned is, is that that question is a forbidden and dangerous question for many people mm -hmm. because of what they've been taught or told and women in particular. So I've had people in my workshops who say, I was told never to ask that question mm -hmm. um, because it will only lead to disappointment. Mm -hmm. um, I've had men who have said, what if you've never allowed yourself that question, you know, and I want to step back for just a second. The power of what strategists do is we use all kinds of questions. So it doesn't have to be a central question, but what I have found as a strategist and in, 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 in marketing and advertising, we work at the speed of business and at the speed of culture. We don't have a lot of time. And when we um, do work, we have, we operate in seconds, right? 30 seconds, uh, 15 seconds, now even six seconds to imprint ourselves on someone. And so we have to find ways that cut through things fast. Mm -hmm. And so what I like about that particular question, and many others like it, they're penetrating questions. So as strategists, we have to uncover the truth 
the essence I talked about earlier, we have to do it quickly because we don't have years and years or even months or weeks with people. We usually have 30 minutes of time interviewing someone or doing a focus group or doing a survey. And so we have to find the sharpest, most penetrating, most unlocking questions. Mm -hmm. And I found that what do you want is one of those questions that we can't help but have Our brains do something where we want to be good students. We want to answer the question and uh, questions hijack our brains. And so when you get a question, something usually comes up, not always for everybody, but for a lot of people, something comes up. Do they dare sit with it? Do they dare let it out? Mm. Do they dare put it on the page or say it out loud? Um, Not all the time, because as I said, it's, We've been conditioned and a lot of women have been conditioned. Do not ask that question. That's a dangerous question. Or for me as an Asian, oh no, that's a selfish question. Mm -hmm. Who are you to ask? What do you want? But I do find it's one of those penetrating, unlocking questions. And there are other questions, you know? So I like to say as a strategist, not all questions are created equal. Some questions take you down long, windy roads. Others cut straight through the bullshit and the noise. And that's what the life brief is trying to do. And I had my own questions that were coming up that I was avoiding. And I like to say the answers we seek tend to lie behind the questions we avoid. Mm -hmm. And so it's an invitation to lean into the fear, Mm -hmm. lean into the agitation, and allow tension to have a role because tension in, in the creative world is where all the juicy stuff is. Yeah, it's all chemical, right? Mm. Yeah. I love that so much. And I love what you said about the relation to want for women. I think that's something Lennon Doyle talks a lot about, um, the way that we as women are conditioned just not to hunger, to not have a desire, to not yes. <clears throat> be really in the space of what I – would call our feminine, which is the desire for like a constant state of like more and evolution and expansion. And so much of what the society has taught us is to shut that instinct to instinctual um, Mm -hmm. urge within us down. And, you know, I work primarily with couples. And what I think is so interesting about what you're saying is whenever I'm talking to couples, when resentment or the thing of like, I'm not happy in this relationship comes up because this person, this person isn't making me happy. Um, two things come up often. I was talking to, or I was, I was talking to Meryl Streep. <laughs> I wasn't talking to Meryl Streep. I, oh talking to Meryl Streep. <laughs> That's I, I just totally a girl. <laughs> Holding out on me. Total lie. I have no idea why. <laughs> but I heard Meryl Streep once in an interview say that when she was really unhappy in her marriage, and she's been married a very long time, whenever she got really still with herself, what was true was that she was unhappy with herself in her life and that she was sort of like projecting that unhappiness onto her partner. But the other thing that I say to couples so often is you get to want what you want, but you have to take responsibility for why Mm. you want what you want. And I think Mm. that's the curiosity that you're speaking to. Like that's the beginning of the inquiry. It's like, if I don't know why, or if I don't know what I want, why don't I? And then Mm. like, can I like lean into the discomfort? I love how you're saying like, we're so quick to like, Ooh, that makes me uncomfortable. Ooh, I don't like the way that feels. Let me not stay with that. Let me move on and say like, I don't know. So shut it down. But It sounds like what you're saying is that's like the jump off point for the work. Yeah. You said two really powerful things. One is to allow yourself to sit Mm. with the questions, Mm -hmm. you know, and allow the answers to bubble up Mm -hmm. and to find you. We don't have to work hard, but sometimes the bravest thing we can do is to sit and give space for the question Mm -hmm. to do its work. The second thing you said is, you know, um, desire, desire is such a dangerous, um, emotion. I don't, I don't know. Is it an emotion? You are the therapist. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll let you, you know, categorize it, but, um, you know, because other questions coming off of what do you want is what do you long for? What do you crave? Mm -hmm. What are you thirsting for? Mm -hmm. What keeps you up at night? 
What grips you? What are you devoted to? You know, these are the questions I think um, I wish schools asked. I wish parents asked. I wish we asked of each other, you know, um, but there are so many ways we can be distracted. That's always on media culture of which I am a part of, you know, in my, in my day job. Um, we could be distracted. We can be binge binging content all day long and not have to sit with any questions. Yeah. Yep. There's, there's a sensuality even in the way that you are speaking those words yep. that is like, such a like tapping into the feminine way of like um like there's a texture in the way that you're speaking the words I like the word isn't coming to me but I think, I think it's so word, fascinating <laughs> yeah like yeah. you can hear it as mm -hmm. Bonnie's speaking and I think mm -hmm. there's something in that in the like what Brene Brown always says is that we can't selectively numb and I think there's just such a way that we've been conditioned to shut down all of those elements of our feminine, all of those sensate feeling ways of being in this life and in the world. And then it's activating for someone yeah. to say, like, tune in, get curious, because it's like, then I like, you said desire is dangerous. And I was so struck by that, because it's like, it's dangerous to feel anything, because then I could feel everything. And I've really oh my conditioned God. myself not to feel, you know. Yes. And I see this in men, you know, I'm raising a boy and I see how naturally emotive they are, mm -hmm. but so many generations of men and boys have been told to stuff those emotions that that's weak to feel or express or, um, admit mm -hmm. that you feel restless, you know, um, incomplete, mm -hmm. Um, unworthy, that you don't want the prescription you've been given for how to be as a man, you know? And I, I, I think it is feminine. We've did, women have been shut out of their feminine and men have been shut down mm -hmm. by their feminine. And we are whole people, right? We are whole beings. And how amazing when I look at leaders who are whole leaders mm -hmm. and can navigate from the full range of their capacity. Um, I so rarely see that in the boardroom and I really want to celebrate the men and I want to unlock the boys mm -hmm. because I think we'd all be so much richer and living from in such vivid ways if we could just uncage mm -hmm. those parts of ourselves. I feel like you in a way are a bit of a Trojan horse in how you're doing this work because, you know, you do, I mean, listen, marketing and advertising as a whole is still very heavy male, you know, populated, especially mm -hmm. at the top, right? We know there's a certain point where women decide, especially in that industry to have children. And then they're like disproportionately uh, underrepresented at the top after they make that choice, right? Because they're punished in a way. Um, and, and I feel like this, this book, this process that you've turned into a book, really, I mean, you were already doing the work, um, is a bit of a Trojan horse for what you were, you and Danae were just speaking to. It's like you go into a boardroom where it is probably very male dominated, uh, and you're able to get to some really deep answers through some questions and some strategies that look very business on the surface, right? Like, oh, you know how this works. This is what we do for a living. Let's talk strategy. And yet the Trojan horse says what we're really doing is we're unlocking a very deep feminine side of self that has been cut off, right? Or you have been told not to listen to or not to pay attention to. And so for that too, I, I commend you because sometimes I think those Trojan horse ways in are some of the most impactful um, and changing ways. Thank you for noting that. That's a really astute observation and one that I've kind of, it's always been at the surface, but you know, um, I've not acknowledged and I have to give so much appreciation to my agency. You know, um, they broke with traditional conventional business wisdom. They made me a partner of the agency when I was living in a different city. This was way before the pandemic and remote work. I was a mother of four, working a four-day week. That is not your um, candidate for making partner. Right, um, and, and they did, you know, and, and they've celebrated 
this thing that I've been in my joy hustle that I've been calling, but it's really my, my life's purpose. I think they've allowed that to blossom and flourish alongside Mm -hmm. of this. And I work alongside some really whole leaders, you know, Mm -hmm. both men and women. And um, I, I get to learn a lot from the laboratory. I think that is our agency, but yes, these are the questions that will not only unlock individuals, but they will unlock boardrooms and companies. And, you know, um, this is, those are the places where this conversation is scarce. That's the desert, right? And we need to have more of these conversations openly in business. Yeah. Something I feel like you and I talked about in Hawaii a little bit that I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on as a woman who has done everything that you've done in your career. I think something happens that Vanessa and I talk to women about a lot when we have children, um, when our lives have looked a certain way and we've, you know, had a certain level of accomplishment and clarity about like where we're headed and what our five-year plans are, whatever that is. Um, And so much of what happens is like, there's this like deep, internal disruption and, you know, everything that I have felt like I've been in the space of maiden or maybe married woman, um, all of a sudden I become a mother and it's just like this cataclysmic shift. And what I find happens so often, and, you know, Vanessa and I have one kid, you have four. So like, I'm like, you just bought me Mothering so at any stage oh. in any way <laughs> is, a fan- I mean, honor all mothers. <laughs> well, sister, you are honored, but. Um, <laughs> I'm a breeder. Yeah. Someone's <laughs> called me a breeder. But I, I want to hear more about if you're willing to share this this time that you're talking about in your marriage, because what I feel like ends up happening for so many couples is I kind of say children put this black light on everything that we weren't talking about and all of the ways that we've just sort of like, you know, been able to function well enough. And then there's just this like grenade that's thrown in and it feels really hard. So how did you- Pooping grenade that just gets thrown right in. (laughs) (laughs) So how do you feel like when you negotiated um, having the type of position that you have, this type of job and being a mother and being a partner, but also sort of finding your way back, if you'll speak to a little bit of that in your marriage? Because I find so many people just, especially right now, are really struggling with this, like, should I stay, should I go Mm -hmm. question in their marriage? Like it's so prevalent Mm -hmm. um, that I'd love to hear whatever your thoughts are. Um, Yeah. So the first answer is there have been many chapters and stages. It's not one long continuum and we've had to find our way to recommit my husband Mm. and I, right. At all those stages, I find any long-term relationship and I've been at this agency for 25 years. So that's Mm -hmm. another long-term relationship in my life. There are many chapters of recommitment where you go into the trough and you dig it all up and say, are we still growing? Mm -hmm. Am I growing from this still? Um, And if so, is it the kind of growth that is healthy and fertile and potent for Mm -hmm. me? Um, And we have to say yes in many times, right? We have this fairy tale story that we've told we've told ourselves or society has told us about marriage, right? It's a one and done, you go to the altar, happily ever after. And every day you have to wake up and choose it, actively choose it. So the life brief came into play at some two critical junctures and they're both transition junctures because we're most vulnerable in transition and having a child is a transition and each child you have after that or each promotion you have or each thing that you launch is its own transition and that's when the egg cracks open and you have to say okay are we still in this for the same reasons um and is this stretching me and who am i when i'm with you and who am i when i'm not with you and that was the question that really brought me back around at our the second time the life brief um, saved my marriage, I had to look deeply at who am I when I'm with my husband and who am I without? And I ju- it just came rushing up. I am, I like myself better when I'm with him. It's hard. It's frustrating. I want to choke him <laughs> a lot, <laughs> um, but he makes me better. 
and he takes me to a growth edge and he shines a light on where I can be better in the ways that I want to be better, you know? So that really um, helped. It, it's always a series of questions, you know, and I call it all a practice because the more you do it, the easier it gets. It, it's very scary, these questions, the first time around. But when we sit with them, allow the answers to bubble up, see that they're not as terrifying as we feared, mm -hmm. maybe write them down and then allow them to push us to braver places, then we often find ourselves in surprising spaces where we can create a different set of circumstances. And you said, should I stay or should I go? So I meet people all the time faced with that question about their work, about their job, about their company, about their relationship, you know, um, about so many things. But what I've found in this practice is the world is not binary as we are made to believe. It is not about yes or no this or that, either or, stay or leave. You know, it is not. It's actually full of possibilities that we're not even looking at. We just deny ourselves, right? Um, there's a buffet to be had, but we're taught that we have very limited options yes. in all of our relationships, including our relationship with ourselves. And that's the most important relationship. And the first one will deny um, for the sake of all the other ones. Um, but creative living, it's why I'm so, I feel so lucky to have spent my adult life in the sandbox with creative misfits mm -hmm. because they really don't take no for an answer. Mm -hmm. They are always seeing what's the more original, what's a more innovative way to look at the situation. How do we reframe this? How do we, you know, what if we try this? What if we try that? So I think that's the thing I want to invite after getting clear is once you get clear, now let's get creative. Mm -hmm. um, how could you bring this brief into being without, while leaving the either or questions behind. You, I'm you break it with you, Bonnie. See, this is like, <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, I forgot how wise you are and like how we would have these conversations in Hawaii and I would be like, God, you're, yes. Let's go to Hawaii all the time. All the time. <laughs> we need Noodle. a little like, refresher of these conversations. Nerd out on this. Well, I love, so you, yeah. you break it down so succinctly too, because in the book, you you know, your parts are get messy, get clear, get active. And so it feels a little bit like the first part of our conversation, even sitting here was all around the mess. It's all around these hard questions, these sitting with the activation, the sitting with the fear and what comes up, right? And then the kind of clarity, the get clear is what you were just speaking to, which is now we get to lay out, okay, what does that look like? Like, what do I do with all of that information that I just kind of gleaned from the mess, right? How do I kind of shine it up and, and put it into something that that feels tantalizing and feels exhilarating for me and feels like what I now want to spend kind of my life energy, right? Like doing. Um, so many juicy words you just yeah. use, <laughs> you know, tantalizing, <laughs> exhilarating, aliveness. These are the ones we should be steeped in. But so many people, you know, our, our society, this hustle culture, especially for business, right? And a lot of women, you know, um, who are high performing, high achieving, type A, those are all great things. So um, there's no, I mean, I'm one of those, right? Perfectionists. Same girl saying. But we want to, <laughs> we want to have the bias for action. You know, we want to get straight to the answer. Mm -hmm. We're afraid to get messy. So everyone skips over the get messy part. That's again, where the juiciness is, you know, you can't get clear, you can't get brave, you can't get creative or courageous unless you allow yourself to get messy. And I think that's the big invitation. I think we're conditioned as women, as high achieving, high performing, you know, um, go getter women to, to do all those things and men even more so, you know, to an exponential effect. But allowing ourselves to be messy, to play in the sand, get in the mud, get dirty a little bit, you know, um, and to create space for that. That's mm -hmm. the revelation I find most people, um, they understand the idea, but the, 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 the permission has not been there 
for hmm. themselves. Yeah. Yeah. That is the you, most potent question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Hey. I was just going to say, like, you, I even noticed in the book, before you even get into part three, which is the, the, the active piece, get active, you're like, stop. <laughs> There's like a whole page, like, slow your roll. If you don't feel, and basically it's these words that we were using, these like tantalizing and excited. And, you know, if you don't feel that from part one and part two, go back. And, yeah. you know, I, I guess I, I wonder when you say go back, is there certain parts of the going back that you want people to specifically go back and, and get into more before they're kind of quote unquote allowed to get active <laughs> says, says the type yeah. A go-getter who just wants to get active. <laughs> I know, I know, right. We all want to move into action, but um, if it's not feeling, if you don't have that sense of fuck yeah, aliveness yeah. from your brief, it's just going to sit there. It's going to leave your mind because it's not tattooed in your heart. When you get to fuck. Yeah. It's just with you all the time. A decision comes up, your brief comes up, it clarifies it and you move, right? Um, you're chasing your goosebumps. That's why it's important to get a brief that gives you goosebumps or butterflies in your belly or fire, you know? Um, and the question is, what have you left off the table in your brief? What have you held back on? What are you hesitating? The beautiful thing about writing and the, why this exercise of the writing and people have said, oh, well, some, some people aren't writing people. They aren't word people. But here's the thing. Our minds are so permissive, too permissive, right? It's like the ocean. A wave comes in a thought. It might be an aha, a lightning rod, a flash of insight. And then suddenly somebody talks to you or sends you a text and boop, it's gone. And I'm in menopause, so I can't remember anything. And so it's like, wait, 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 what was that? I don't even remember I had that feeling. But when I write it down, I get to be in relationship with it. So every time it becomes a mirror, right? When I hold those words up and I read them, I have a feeling. I already know whether I want to admit it or not, if I'm holding back, where I'm holding back, what excites me, you know? And so once you write it down in draft form, then we push it. Now I'm going to challenge you, find juicier words, find bolder statements. And this is a private practice. So you're not sharing with anyone but yourself. Mm -hmm. But even that makes some people squeam squeamish, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, but the power is in looking at those words and pressing and pushing and nudging yourself to go braver, use bigger thoughts. And I, I do want to point out that sometimes the bravest thing that we can do is to say that we want to pause, mm -hmm. that we want mm -hmm. to slow down, that we want to get off the treadmill. So when I say be brave, be courageous, I don't mean go big, go home. You know, it, I mean, be honest, what terrifies you, but you really want it. Yeah. I I mean, so many things, but I feel like I want to circle back to that you said. And I do think that it's so often about like the brave thing is to pause and get honest. And can I start there? What are the questions that I'm afraid to ask? What are the truths that I'm even afraid of knowing? But I am going to steal that clarifying question of um, like, am I a better version of myself with this mm -hmm. person? Because that is like oh my God, do I talk to women every single day where it's like, I have to make myself a little bit smaller. I have to sort of like, if I am the fullest, biggest embodiment, I know that was my truth. <laughs> like if I am that in this relationship, it won't fly, it won't work. And so if this person is expanding me in the way that we are, if we are continuously growing, then I think that is like, there's so much clarity in that question. And that can be with, with work, with whatever the- Exactly, with friendships, is. right? Yeah. Does this friendship make me want to make myself small to make it better, more comfortable? Does this okay. job- um, does this job feel threatened by how big I've become or, or where I'm getting my aliveness? You know, mm -hmm. it, it's the same for any relationship. Yes. Hmm. Brilliant. I um I wrote down a bunch of other like I was obsessed with this and I have, maybe you can take us through kind of the thinking around this some of these other techniques that you use like penning your eulogy 
Mm. I love that. Can you talk to us a little bit about like, I guess, why, like why include that? Kind of what comes up? What do you find comes up for people when they do that? Why does that feel like an important practice? So we use that as strategists in with brands, right? We, we go out to their customers um, and we ask if this brand died or went away tomorrow out of your life, mm. what would you eulog- eulogize? Wow, mm. tough, tough word for me to say. Um, but uh, and, and we get the most poetic responses. And what you start to see is the real stuff bubbles up and all the noise you know, falls away and you get to really understand what that brand or product or service. And I know that sounds very superficial when we're talking about life, but you see vividly what that brand's role is in people's lives. If it went away, you know, and it's the same um, that I found with people when they think about what they want to be remembered for or how they want to review and reflect on their lives in their final moments, that just cuts out everything. Mm -hmm. Everything that's important bubbles up to the top. I had a great um, Harvard Business School professor who talked about our resume values and then our eulogy values. Mm -hmm. And our resume values are all the outward achievements that we are striving for in this moment, in, in lots of our moments. It's what we want to put on our CVs, what we want the world to see in us and um, the eulogy values are how we want to be remembered at the very, very end. What is the legacy that we want to leave behind? And it's the tension between those two that create the momentum for us to, you know, pursue and take a chunk out of life. And it's not that one is better than the other, but both play such a significant role in how we show up every day. Um, and you need both. You you want some of those tangible um, goals or achievements and, and they don't have to be what society deems, but they have to be the things that make you feel alive, that grip you at night and you know, in your heart of hearts, it's what calls to you. But then the eulogy values are the ones that define how you want to show up for people, Mm -hmm. how you want to show up for yourself. What do you hold sacred? What are you devoted to? Mm -hmm. And I love playing in the tension because both exist and that's real life. Mm -hmm. And so do you find when you're talking to people in business settings about eulogy values that they still end up being interpersonal values in the way that I want to be experienced by the people that worked with me? Hell yeah. Leaders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, those kind of whole leaders that we're talking about, they're driven by their legacy, you know, and they're not afraid to confront their own doubts. I think that's what makes for great leaders is really confident, true leaders, they're not afraid of the messiness of leadership. And leadership is goddamn messy all the time because you're leading people and the business that you know as therapists. They're just having like a hundred, a thousand, 40,000 relationships, you know? Um, If you're not attuned to that and the messiness that comes with working people work Mm -hmm. um then go focus on content there's a lot of you know i just focus on the the content of the strategy but leader strategy leadership you know values those are your people are hearing them and seeing them and feeling them whether or not you want to go there yourself Mm -hmm. i love that i mean i know i'm sitting with that (laughs) Yeah. I'm just so struck by, you know, I am listening so much to the language underneath so much of what you're saying. I I know, you know, because we talked about a little bit, I'm obsessed with like how we integrate these, um, what I believe is like the rise of feminine values within all of us with healthy masculine values within a society. And there's so much of what you're saying that is that, right? Like how do we show up with a grounded sense of self and that I stay steady in my sense of self in the midst of the chaos and the untamed energy that will come with our humanness? But how do I um, come back to a center of what I know to be true? 
And we're all going to need those centers as AI continues to disrupt, right? The changes in culture and as traditional paths evaporate in front of our very eyes, right? We have children, they're going to university. People have said the jobs that they will come out of university with may not have existed when they started college. Mm -hmm. And so the pathways are eroding in yes. front of us, right? With technology, with um, how how politics are shifting, religion and how we're embracing, everything's becoming fluid. And if you aren't anchored in your center, That's right. you're going to have a hard time navigating. Yes. And that even to what you were saying about like, if I am anchored in a center, then I can be exploratory about like, what are the other ways that this can be done yes. where I can design my life yeah. in a way that like I'm defining for myself, but I have to have a core sense of self in order to be safe enough to do that. It gives you the when you're clear risks, right? I mean, if you don't that's right, it, it actually doesn't even feel like a risk, it right? right? It, 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 it takes the heat. Yeah. <laughs> it punctures it's just fun. the fear <laughs> of risk, right? It's yeah. not a risk because it's true. Yeah. You're clear that it's true because you're clear about what you want and what's your essence. And it's very easy. It becomes much easier to say no. Now, do we have FOMO? We want to do these? Of course, of course. But for the stuff that counts, where the stakes are high, that clarity gives you the access to the answers you need to make those decisions. Well, and I love too that, you know, so much, this goes back to what you were saying about the question of should I stay or should I go in relationship? And Danae, when you pulled out that one question that Bonnie said or asked herself around who am I when I'm with this person and when I'm not, right? Like, am I, am I in a state of growing uh, and evolving in a, in a good way, in a way that I want to. I feel like even that applies to this conversation now that we found ourselves in, because the the way that the 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 way and how quickly the universe is changing around us, and I'm saying universe because it is everything. Like mm -hmm. you said, I mean, it's our work, it's our relationships, it's our relationship to self, it's our sexuality. I mean, everything, right? It's changing at such a rapid pace and we are being inundated every single moment with how about this? How about this? This option, this option, how da, 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 right? It's this constant like barrage that this coming back to who am I when I'm in, when I'm doing this thing? Who am I when I'm with this person? What do I feel when I'm pursuing this career path? What those kind of questions cut out the noise. And it feels like part of the like alchemical uh, process that's being almost provided to us or given to us is actually the barrage of bullshit. It's like the universe is going, how much shit can I throw at you? And how much can I almost like overwhelm you until you pay attention to how fucking important it is to come into your center and answer these fucking questions, right? It's like, it's like, it's all being constructed for us. Like, let me just keep throwing the shit at you until you learn that the shit is not the learning. The shit is the distraction. We got to get clear in who we are. I mean, this is so much of what today and I talk about around codependency recovery and, and healing mm -hmm. our codependency with each other, with ourselves, with the universe is because we've never been asked these questions. It's never been safe to answer these questions. And finally, I think evolution of our species is actually, it, it's required that we sit with these. It's required that we answer these questions in, in a way it's never been. And, and it's, it's kind of like a precipice. We're really on the precipice of something just so different. Hmm. I'm excited by that precipice. I know it's, Agreed. it's scary, right? Agreed. It's a, it's a sharp edge. Um, at the top of the, this conversation, you had talked about, you know, blaming your partner, you know, um, mm -hmm. or blaming the job and, yeah. Yes, there there are circumstances that are hard. They are challenging. They demand a lot of us. But again, I, I find that once we you do the work and get messy and get clear, you start to also see um, where you can take accountability mm -hmm. um, for the dance, I call it. You know, in the third part of the book, I shift the question from what do you want? to how do you want? It's not how to get what you want, not, not the how question I'm talking about. It's mm -hmm. how do you want to show up 
now Mm -hmm. in this part of your life? How do you want to shift? How do you want to love better? How do you want to serve better? How do you want to lean in? You know, these, then it suddenly takes a turn into accountability and agency, mm-hmm. which is that, that is the ultimate in, invitation of this practice is because we, we lead the dance. And when we shift how we dance, it's an invitation to everyone around us, our circumstances and the people to show up and dance differently, differently too. You know, so many people ask me, can I life brief my husband? Can I life brief my, you know, boss? Can I life brief my mom? You know, and no, you can't. But if you get clear on how you want to shift and show up, that will automatically invite them to show up differently. I love it. That's right. You know, it's funny before you came on, Bonnie, Vanessa was saying there's so much about advertising that's so similar to the work that we do in psychology. And as you're talking, I was like, oh, it's completely individuation work. Like it's, Mm -hmm. you know, Jung talked about like the first half of our life were oriented towards the outside world and society. And then later in life, we start to Mm -hmm. individuate and the focus becomes like an inward exploration, right? And that's what you're speaking to. And I think what we are living through, and Vanessa and I were talking to someone the other day that was saying like, we're living through a period in history where it's sort of like we were chosen actually to be alive at this time Mm -hmm. because there was such a cataclysmic shift in humanity that's occurring. But we were like, we signed up for this knowing we were going to be the leaders to usher in this new earth paradigm. And I think it's so potent the way that you're speaking to how we, um, we utilize these tools in the workplace and in all of our relationships, but that none of this is about anything other than our relationship with ourselves. And I love what you said before about you know, so many of us culturally were raised to think that bringing the focus to ourselves is selfish Mm -hmm. when it's actually the complete opposite. Because when I am really clear on who I am and my why and what is motivating my behaviors, like, is this based on codependency and my need to like cling on to something because I'm afraid versus like what I truly want, then all of a sudden we're able to show up in the world and be of service in a completely different way. So true. And you hit on all the big words, the big ideas. You said it's our knowing, right? It's a return actually to our knowing. And we are in a society right now that uphold our knowledge. Like we're all living from the neck up, right? Mm -hmm. We talked about that in Hawaii. We've become a neck up. You know, everything's about the, the facts and the, you know, things in our, the data points in our brains and who can spit that out. And it's a race on who can come out on top on the knowledge pile. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's actually about the knowing, which is not in our brain, but mm-hmm. way deeper down in our bodies. And you had talked about mothering and what was so potent about becoming a mother mm-hmm. is, um, going through the fire of creation, right? Mm -hmm. Literally creating another human being, which is the place that creativity is birthed. Mm -hmm. Creativity is not in our heads. Creativity is, you know, comes from creation and women are at the center of that. And if we can tap into our knowing, reconnect with it and creating from the neck down, that's where all the potency is. And that is where the future is. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. Well, it's snap, 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 snap like, to that. <laughs> yeah. We could keep you forever. And I'm so grateful to get to, you know, expose more of our audience to you because you are just such a gift and so, so much wisdom. Um, but want to be mindful of time. So we're going to ask you our lightning round of questions that we ask all of our guests. Um, So the first question is, who have been your greatest teachers, mentors, people that have impacted your journey up to this point? There are so many. I'd say, you know, there's a couple. My mom, you know, a Chinese woman who... um, of her generation who married a man out of security and married into a very volatile, you know, um, life. My father 
I, I understand him better now, uh, posthumously than than ever before, and um, and I see. But she really held our family together. Mm -hmm. She married someone for financial security, which was our culture, you know, and, and the, the 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 gift that or the advice that she was given, only to end up becoming the breadwinner and holding it all together in every which way. And there was a strength in that, um, a, a loyalty that surpassed circumstance. Um, so I, I think she very much is someone that I have learned from through action that I didn't understand and I actually blamed for a long time, but have come full circle um, and really admire. She does not complain. She never gave up. You know, she saw her things through. Um, and I think in doing so, found this immense strength that she brought to bear and continues to bring to bear. Um, and then lots of teachers and with, but, but all from the wisdom world, you know, um, I love that I get to ride the interact intersection of creativity and wisdom, mm -hmm. ancient, timeless wisdoms, and then the energy and force and fire of creativity. And I have to say, I work with, some creative legends who I've got to learn from along the way, Jeff Goodby, Rich Silverstein, Margaret Johnson, Margaret Johnson, who in a world that is still male dominated is a cowgirl that just kicked, kicked that glass ceiling, you know, and brought the rest of us along, you know, and really challenges you know, the industry to be braver and mm -hmm. to be more innovative and just, you know, I can go on and on, but mm -hmm. those are some of the few. Love that. Yeah. Okay. So this idea of flow that we all know so well now in this culture, right? Like this idea that you can be completely aligned, your kind of thinking self and your knowing self, like we were talking about earlier and just blink your eyes and a whole day could go by. What What is flow for you? Like, what do you find yourself doing when you, you're in that state? Right here, right now with the two of you. Mm -hmm. This is, this is, this is the stuff that matters. Um, I feel like everything else in my life to this point so far has been boot camp or training <laughs> for the real work and you're doing the real work. And it's really an honor to be in conversation with people doing that kind of work. This is where change and transformation and um, a turn for the better mm -hmm. starts. Mm -hmm. yes. um, and what breaks your heart, Bonnie? Oh gosh, there's so many things at this moment. Um, we had a real loss in our community um, last week, yeah. another kid. Um, and I will say what breaks my heart is that we don't have the scaffolding. We don't have the centering. We aren't present with our knowing for our children, especially our boys. And there is so much opportunity to put in front of them to bring out with from within them what healthy masculinity. I think our girls have so many amazing, iconic women and stories and um, messages right now. And that's not to say that that fight isn't over, but we need them for our boys. Mm. Sorry to interject for just a second, but you spoke to something in a way that I haven't heard someone say it. And I think I've been having a lot of conversations around masculinity and um, the way that men are struggling right now. And I think that's it, that like we as women have so many healthy models of what it looks like to persevere and stand in our power and get to know ourselves. And men really are lacking in that. Mm -hmm. Like we don't have elders for men mm -hmm. in this yes. society that they can look to. I want to celebrate men like my husband, you know, who still has to face, you know, the the criticism and judgment of society because he is the lead parent. He is the fulcrum, 
of our family center. And he is a whole man modeling what it's like. And I'm so excited to see what it, what my children are going to be because they had their dad at the center of their lives. You know, when they wake up, this, this really hurt me, you know, um, really early on at night when they'd wake up, they wouldn't scream mommy, they'd scream daddy. And I remember the pangs and that just took me to some of my own narrative, limiting narratives about you're not a good mom. You're not, you know, you're not the first one they call. But then I had to shift to, wait, how amazing that they look to their dad when they get hurt, you know, and that's the first name that they call. We need to celebrate those men. That just took me out, buddy. (laughs) I started crying. Woo! Yeah. More of those men. More of those men. And celebrating those men and that mm-hmm. are showing up in that way. Because they're there. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Thank we need you to celebrate them to that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. All right. And the last question will take us up out of our tears, uh, hopefully. <laughs> what um what's your favorite food, Bonnie? Oh my gosh. It's, <laughs> it's all it's it's Asian for sure. Um gosh. Oh, okay, everyone. Kimchi. Mm. I love kimchi. I'll, I'll, I'll order a hot dog if it comes with kimchi. I'll eat that kind of meat. I'll, I'll eat anything with kimchi. Put it on everything. Mm. I'm, I'm here for it. <laughs> here for it. <laughs> well, Bonnie, I, you know, so many things. I think Vanessa's right. You are truly bringing this conversation into places where it really needs to be heard in such a potent way. I believe as a Trojan horse, I think you're speaking to a lot of what we're talking about constantly about how we are rising in this integration of our masculine and feminine. And you're sort of speaking to it in a way that like those who are like maybe in the world of business and their minds and like execution can hear it and really resonate Mm -hmm. with what you're saying. So thank you for doing that unbelievably important work at this moment in history. I just think it's such a game changer. I'm so excited um, for everyone to get to read this book. I'm so excited for everyone to get to know you because, you know, Vanessa and I absolutely fell in love with you in Hawaii. And we're just it's like, mutual. Oh so mutual. God, if moment. we could do this all day. <laughs> yes. Um, but Thank you for coming on and sharing your brilliance with us. And um, we'll have to get together again soon because it's really, really good. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Thank you for doing the work that you do. It's so important. I knew that from the first moment I saw you at the airport. Um, I'll meet you in Hawaii, Costa Rica, (laughs) Arizona, wherever you go. Um, More time with the two of you. Guys, go out. It's going to be, when does it come out? January, officially? January 17th. And it's up for pre-order now. Anywhere, pre-order it now. Pre-order anywhere it now. that sells books. A Life it, Brief, a playbook for No Regrets Living by Miss Bonnie Wan. Love it. So excited.